It's an honor to be here today to welcome my good friend Bill Bratton back to the NYPD and to this forum. My brother Eddie, who was sitting right next to me in the years when we did the combat auto theft program and all the other things we did at Douglas Elliman in those years. Uh, Eddie and I had the pleasure of working closely with Bill during his first term as police commissioner. Among other things, we created the NYPD Heroes Award together, uh, and that was a cash prize arranged by the NYPD for Good Samaritans who performed extraordinary acts of heroism at a crime scene. Bill, we were privileged to work with you then, and we're thankful to have you back now. Everyone in this room could probably come up with a different reason why, but the results you produced for the cities you've made safer during your astounding career are all the reason any of us need to welcome you back with open arms. And when we consider that those gains were made despite extraordinary challenges, our admiration grows. In 1994, Commissioner Bratton took the reins of the NYPD on behalf of a city that felt under siege. There were more than 2,000 murders a year then, a number hard to fathom now, and more than 175,000 violent crimes. Commissioner Bratton went to work quickly, pioneering new policing philosophies such as broken windows, while implementing the game-changing use of data and analytics with the CompuStat program. The commissioner made a U-turn with the city's worsening crime trends. After just two years, homicides were down by a third and violent crime down by a quarter. Even jaded New Yorkers were impressed as his astonishing record of success became known as the New York miracle. But perhaps most importantly, Bill shifted the paradigm, creating the foundation for a new generation of policing strategies in our city, which still keep us safe today. CompuStat remains at the core of NYPD and in the greatest form of flattery, it has been replicated in police departments throughout the United States and indeed throughout the world. Still anxious to conquer new challenges, Bill took on a, the Los Angeles Police Department's scandalized by corruption, hampered by low morale, and distrusted by its citizen, citizenry. Bill took it all head on. He engaged the community directly, often asking residents in various neighborhoods what they thought the LAPD could do to protect them better. He also employed the same cutting edge use of data, not only to decrease crime, but to also to create a new culture of transparency and accountability in the department, leading to greater collaboration with citizens. Once again, the results were incredible. During Bill's tenure in LA between 2002 and 2009, the homicide rate was cut in half and all crime decreased by more than a third. Remarkably, by the time he left, 83% of LA residents also thought the police force was doing a good to excellent job, including more than 80% of Latinos and more than 70% of African Americans, according to a Harvard study. Those are the kinds of results any city would want to see. After LA, Bill headed to the private sector, where he cha chaired Kroll and also founded Bratton Technologies and the Bratton Group to bring his expertise to the wider world, making millions safer through his work. He also served as vice chairman of the United States Homeland Security Advisory Council. And now Bill is back in the Big Apple. That's good news at this pivotal moment for our city. Once again, the NYPD and our city face daunting, unique new challenges, growing, growing terrorism threats, protecting civil rights, cybercrime, and a myriad of other problems. But if anyone can take on these challenges, it's the man here today who again and again has shown he can deliver under the toughest circumstances. And we've already seen the commissioner out there, ear to the, ear to the ground once again, sharing his thoughts with New Yorkers and listening to our concerns. We've already read about his changes to stop and frisk. We've already heard him talk about the need for greater collaboration between the NYPD, community leaders, and citizens. In short, we're already beginning to get the benefits of his administration. We all know Bill Bratton gets New York. We all know he gets results. And we're very happy to see him again. Now one month in, we're all looking forward to hearing Bill share his priorities and his vision with us. So Commissioner William Bratton, welcome back. Howard, thank you so much for those very, very gracious remarks that uh, 
as I was sitting listening to you and Richard, and Richard Avon, thank you to you and the Citizens Crime Commission for allowing me the opportunity once again to come and speak to New Yorkers. But uh, as I was listening to the, uh, uh, what the Milsteins have contributed over the years, it, uh, we tend to forget that sometimes, uh, Howard, Ed, that, uh, and uh, you've been there. You've been there for this city, and you've certainly been there for this police department, and we're all the better for it, and I'll certainly not be shy about continuing to ask for that assistance, that advice, and that collaboration. Um, it is good to be back. And what I'd like to do with you this morning is, one, introduce you to some of the new members of the team as I'm assembling that team. Uh, many of you in the room, and if I could, I'd like to just introduce some of them that I know are in here in the room. And uh, it's both a co collaboration of people who are already in the department as well as some that I'm bringing back into the department again. Uh, my new Deputy Commissioner for uh, Office of Management Planning, Bill Andrews, is here with me. He My Deputy Commissioner for Counterterrorism and Intelligence, John Miller, is in the room. John is, uh, like myself, uh, he keeps uh, coming back that, uh, <laughs> the third time. Uh, also, uh, my uh, new Deputy Commissioner for Collaborative Strategies, Susan Herman, is in the room. And I believe also we have uh, uh, my first Deputy Commissioner, uh, Chief, Pen uh, Chief Commissioner Pinheiro is here. <laughs> the Deputy, uh, Deputy Commissioner Billich, who uh, runs our CompStat processes. <laughs> he, he probably has the biggest challenge of all because he's trying to fill the shoes of the late, great Jack Maple. Jack, uh, who was so instrumental and uh, uh, such a key player in the turnaround that we all began to experience in the subways in the 1990s and then in the city that uh, his legacy lives on, and his, his lovely wife, uh, uh, Bridget O'Connor, is also in the room with us, and I'm so pleased to have her back with us. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about uh, what is happening in the NYPD, what is going to be happening as we go forward. And I want to talk uh, on the foundation of something that you found at your table, which is Sir Robert Peel's Nine Principles of Policing. Uh, Moses had ten commandments, Sir Robert Peel had nine advisories, and uh, he shaped so much of what I have come to find over the last 44 years uh, as what is the true meaning of policing. What are we all about? The expression, something, old, everything old is new again, well, he wrote this so many years ago, and it's as, it's as relevant today as it was back then, if I may. Sir Robert Peel. He died nearly 165 years ago. Hopefully each of you received the sheet that I just mentioned with information about Peel and his nine principles of policing on the way in this morning. Peel is, as I mentioned, one of my heroes, a great British statesman who served twice as Prime Minister of Britain. He is also considered by many, including me, to be the father of modern policing. As British Home Secretary, he created the London Metropolitan Police in 1829. Their history goes back even further than ours here in New York. In fact, the term Bobby's in England is his personal namesake, Bobby Peel. Peel was truly ahead of his time as the nine principles show. In his lessons frame the vision of collaborative policing, I want to share with you today. And the collaborative policing that is going to be the foundation of all that we do in the New York City Police Department moving forward in the years ahead. Take Peel's first principle. The basic mission for which the police exists is to prevent crime and disorder prevent crime disorder. 70s and 80s, we focused on reacting to it, and we saw the disaster that that created in this city. Policing is first and foremost the prevention, but also always trying to improve the reaction, the response to it, because unfortunately, despite our best efforts, we cannot prevent everything. No police agency has done a better job of preventing crime and disorder over the past 20 years than the New York City Police Department. The benefits of this city have been enormous. A thriving economy, a rising population, eight and a half million of us now. Record numbers of tourists, 56 million this past year. 28 million when uh, Rudy Giuliani and I first came in in 1994. Sustained business investment, hotels, restaurants, uh, incredible. And rising real estate values. 
Good on the one hand, but when you have to pay the taxes on them, not so good on the other hand. All of it rests on a solid foundation of public safety. In our democracy, the first obligation of government is public safety. Without it, everything else suffers. No city understands that better than this city. We saw the results in the 70s and 80s of a disinvestment in public safety. In the 90s, starting with David Dinkins and his Safe Streets, 6,000 more cops, continuing through Rudy Giuliani, continuing through Mike Bloomberg, and now continuing through the mayor I'm privileged to work for, the city has continued its commitment to public safety and look at the benefits. Our intention is to keep the foundation strong through a relentless focus on the main mission of crime fighting and counterterrorism, the new crime, the new threat, and no city in the world is as threatened by counterterrorism, excuse me, by terrorism as we are. Fortunately, no city in the world has the combination of collaborative efforts between the federal government, our colleagues, the FBI, CIA, and other federal agencies, and the New York City Police Department. And that area is in extraordinarily good hands in the hands of John Miller, who uh, I personally recruited to come back and take over that very function. As Peel points out in his second principle, public approval for the action of the police is essential to this task. There's no question that New York is a far safer city than it was in the past. This should be a cause for celebration for the entire city. Yet, instead of being hailed for their accomplishments, our police are all too often held in suspicion in many neighborhoods and oftentimes by the media. Where the partnership should exist, there is tension. One of the main reasons I returned as police commissioner was to find out why and to try and do something about it. I love this city, love this department, and the main reason for coming back was that there is a tension that I've, that I've referenced, a tension that needs to be addressed. And I'd like to thank myself and the team that I'm assembling with more changes to come that we will be in a position to ensure that all the gains of the past are in fact not lost, but in fact increased and improved upon. But as we move forward, that there is a new relationship between the city's police force and its communities, particularly its communities of color. But to do that, we have to address the use or overuse of the police tactic of stop, question, and frisk that has become so consequent, so uh, controversial. It is the essential tool of policing. We must have it, but we must use it respectfully, lawfully, and compassionately. For too long, this policy was, has weighed heavily on police community relations in this city and resulting in some significant new oversight for the department, the potential monitor, and inspector general, and significant additional new policies and procedures that we will have to adhere to. Last week, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that the city will be dropping its appeal of the decision rendered in the case of Floyd versus the city of New York. I believe the mayor's announcement was a very important first step that will allow us to move forward and put this divisive issue behind us. I am supportive of getting these issues resolved as quickly as possible. Get the inspector general appointed, if there is to be a monitor, get that person appointed, and I will assemble a team to work with them collaboratively so that we can as quickly as possible address the issues of concern and get it behind us so that we're in a position to move forward very similar to what I did in Los Angeles for seven years when I was chief of the LAPD. I intend to work closely with the federal monitor and the relevant parties, such as the Inspector General, to implement a consent decree that will allow our police officers to go about their work confidently and in full compliance with the law. In LA, we managed to reduce crime to its lowest levels in a very long time. Howard talked about that in his remarks. While we also gained, as he referenced, unprecedented support from the police from the minority community. As much as attention has been focused on my time in the New York City Police Department, I personally and professionally believe my most successful time was in the Los Angeles Police Department, when not only did we get crime down and keep it down, it's now going into, I think it's uh, 12 or 13 straight year crime decline there, but we also got it right with our communities of color. A city that had been at war with its minority community for 50 years, as reflected in the Harvard poll that uh, Harvard cited, and a corner, as the LA Times editorialized, had finally been turned on race relations. It didn't happen here in New York to that extent. I'm hoping that as we move forward and make our reforms that it improves to the same extent that LA experienced, where the issues of tension between communities of color and a police force that's committed to improving the lives in those communities is in fact resolved, and that we have a mutual admiration and respect for each other. I believe we can be equally successful here. 
In the meantime, my message to our officers on this matter has been very direct. The message I've been delivering for 40 years. You can't break the law to uphold it. I believe it's a very good sign that even as stops are down considerably this year, overall crime also, as we're moving into the new year, is also down. We are having spikes in certain categories, uh, murders, but it's too early in the year, it's too early in terms of trending. But my belief is this department has the capacity to keep crime levels low, to deal with the spikes as they occur, and at the same time continue to address the issues of controversy in a way that we are not only able to keep the crime low, but improve our relationships with the communities. I've also directed our new commissioner of training, Benjamin Tucker, who joined the New York City Police Department as a patrol officer in 1969 who will begin in the next several weeks, who will be coming on board in the next several weeks to conduct a wholesale review of our training on all elements of what we do, but particularly our training as it relates to our new recruits and how they're trained to deal with the streets of New York City and the issue of stop, question, and frisk. We will make whatever changes are necessary to ensure the effective constitutional use of this tactic, this essential tactic. Related to this, we are also revising our approach to Operation Impact the well-intended and, in fact, successful operation that has helped to keep crime low in an apartment that lost 6,000 officers. We tend to not reflect enough on how many police officers we have lost in the city. 6,000, an average of 75 officers per precinct. So Operation Impact was intended to deal with that loss by putting overtime officers and officers right out of the academy into the most troubled precincts to deal with rising crime in those precincts well intended but with the unintended tragic consequences of the stop, question, and frisk controversy. While the program has been effective in reducing crime, as I've referenced, it had incredibly unintended consequences which we will deal with for some time to come. And so we must think of ourselves this question, are we giving these young people the experience they need? When I talk about reforming stop, question, frisk, operation impact, how do we do a better job of training these young men and women who are committed to policing the city? I don't think we have done enough, and the reviews I've been conducting over the last month or so have convinced me that many changes are necessary in their training and how they go out onto the streets of the city. Richard Aborn, uh, uh, by the way, I should mention that uh, he's managing director of his law firm that uh, has given us countless hours of time and advice over the last six to eight weeks that uh, helping us in this area. So, Richard, uh, I neglected to make that comment and thank you at the beginning of this conversation. About the issue of these kids that are going out into the streets of our most dangerous neighborhoods, uh, minimally supervised uh, with training that has probably not been adequate to address the issues they're going to address out in the streets. If you talk to most veteran cops about their time, their time as a rookie, and chance, chances are they'll have a story or two about the wisdom of the seasoned officer who took them under his or her wing. There is an undeniable value in learning from others who can provide context to a new officer's environment. With 10 to 12 impact officers assigned to one supervisor, our newest members don't always get the full benefit of that experience. I recently conducted a number of focus groups of the Operation Impact officers. And to a person, they all talk about their desire, their desire to work with more seasoned officers to learn and that when they do have that occasion, they find that the most beneficial part of their new experience. I recognize that because 43 years ago, I was one of those new officers. And the habits of a lifetime are shaped by those first formulative months. The policeman that I think I became, the police leader that I believe I am, were shaped in my first three to six months on the job. Let me just share with you a comment from my book, Turnaround, written with Peter Nobler, who is in the audience today and who so accurately captured uh, my experience uh, growing up in policing. And this is about my time as a rookie officer in Police District 3 in Mattapan. I was fortunate to find Paul Baker. Baker was in his 30s, had been a cop for about 10 years, and spent several years in Mattapan. His partner recently got up in the transfer out of District 3, and I was lucky to be assigned to work with him my first summer. I had been bouncing from partner to partner for a while before he and I were assigned fairly steadily. Baker knew the ropes. The best word to describe him was conscientious. He was as quick with sardonic comment as anyone, but he took his job seriously. We were sitting in Dunkin' Donuts once when a breaking and entering call came in. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. 
Put the cover in your coffee, he told me. Let's go. It's just a report, I said. We can finish the coffee. When a call comes in, he said firmly, we go. That had not been the practice with some of the other cops I'd ridden with. If it wasn't an emergency, you basically took your time getting there. Baker was a different breed. When somebody calls, they want us. That's what we're getting paid to do, and that's what we're going to do. He was a straight shooter. He handled the issues of corruption, treatment of prisoners, and everything the same way. At a very critical time in my career in life, Baker was the perfect partner. My goal is to give every New York cop, every New York recruit, the perfect partner. Because the habits of that first year are going to last for the next 20. And if we're not supervising them, if we're not working with them, if we're not correcting them, if we're not training them, then for the next 19 years, we're not going to get all that they can be and all that this city needs them to be. Let me emphasize, uh, Operation Impact is not going away. It is an essential tool of the department that has lost 6,000 officers. That's the reality. We need it, and it needs to be, be kept in place, but we need to reform it. We're exploring the possibility of expanding it using seasoned officers and overtime. I've asked Deputy Commissioner Tucker to craft a new policy for the program to be ready in time for the next class of recruits who will enter the police academy this summer. Upon the completion of their training, they may still be placed in high, high crime areas, but they will also spend more time being mentored once they get on the streets. All of this is in keeping with the spirit of Sir Robert Peel's third principle, which says that police must secure the willing cooperation of the public in voluntary observance of the law. And fourth, that cooperation diminishes proportionally to the necessity of the use of physical force. By reforming stop and frisk and operation impact, we diminish the number of unnecessary or unwarranted stops. This fosters the goodwill we need to secure the willing cooperation of affected communities and to partner with them in reducing crime. The police, more than most, have a profound capacity to affect social change. I've seen it, I believe it. But to do that, we must seek active and productive engagement on problem solving both within our own ranks and with the public. It is a shared responsibility, and I will make that point in every remark that I make to the public that we will work with you, but we can't do it alone, and you have an obligation to work with us. That's how it works in democracies. That's how it must work to be successful. One of the ways we intend to do this is through social media. The whole world is uh, living now on social media. So too is the NYPD. We've got a very active Facebook page, a YouTube channel, you and even follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Zach Tuman, uh, a deputy commissioner that is not in the room, I believe, uh, we, I've hired. Uh, is leading our efforts to leverage the uh, tremendous potential inherent in these and other platforms to foster greater collaboration in public safety. And what it also fosters is transparency. The idea that there should be no secrets in the NYPD. So we're going to do more to open up the organization, to make it more inclusive, to make our information more readily available to the public, to try to format it in a way that it's easily retrievable. That's our commitment to basically shared responsibility. If we want you to work with us, we have an obligation to let you know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the help that we need to finish it. These tools are going to give us the capacity to track opinion, all public opinion also, as never before. But as Peel's, Peel's fifth principle reminds us, we can only earn public favor through absolute impartial service to the law. The police must uphold the law equally for every citizen, no matter where they live or who they are. We must treat them with compassion and respect. That is essentially true when it comes to the victim's crime. Think about everything we ask of the victim of a crime. To take off work, to find child care for their kids, come down to the precinct to file a report, to make themselves available to detectives, to talk to a district attorney again and again and again, and then to testify in court all on their own time, not compensated after they've experienced what, they may, what might have been the most traumatic and unsettling event in their lives. The least we can do is to help them to feel safe and do no further harm. Like a doctor, we should do no harm, particularly those who have already been harmed. I think we can do a much better job of that. And to that end, I have tasked the NYPD's new Deputy Commissioner for Collaborative Strat Policing, Susan Herman, a former professor of criminal justice at Pace University and a world-renowned expert in crime victims' rights, to lead an examination of every single way the department comes into contact with victims. 
That includes everything from how 911 operators respond to the actions of responding officers and investigators, to how victims retrieve their property after a prosecution and everything in between. We will look at the department through the lens of our most important and vulnerable constituency and ask how can we make their interactions with us better. If we treat victims respectfully and do all we can to keep them safe, we'll not only increase their participation in the criminal justice process, we'll win the trust and confidence of them. The exercise of restraint both in terms of dealing with the public and the use of physical force is the subject of Robert Peel's sixth principle. His seventh principle speaks to the need for the police to always have the public interest at heart. In his words, in his words, the police are the public and the public are the police. We must be like this. We cannot be like this. They are the only members of the public, he says, who are paid to give full-time attention to duties, which are incumbent on every citizen in the interest of community welfare and existence. Effectively, what he is saying is we all have the obligation to serve. Police are paid to do it, but that then, in the oath they take, increases their responsibility. Our collaboration with Mayor de Blasio's Vision Zero Traffic Safety Initiative is one such duty. We cannot allow more unnecessary deaths to take place on our roadways. A death by homicide or a death by accident still is a death that leaves grieving families behind. Together with the Mayor's staff and the Department of Transportation, we're working to develop a coordinated plan of action while at the same time addressing some of the most problematic locations in the city. While the year is still young, I'm happy to report that we are, in fact, making progress. So far in 2014, we've seen a 28% decrease in motor vehicle fatalities compared to last year. We've also recorded a 43% reduction in the number of pedestrians killed. As the mayor has stated, we won't rest, however, until there are none. We are still very early on in the year, and those statistics are soft. We'll see how we do as we progress. But as we progress, we're also going to be focusing a lot more attention on not only reacting better to investigate incidents that occur, but more importantly, to prevent them. Peel's eighth principle tells us that the police should always direct their action directly, strictly towards their functions and never appear to usurp the powers of the judiciary. I'm sure the judges here today, and there are a number of you, will be relieved about that, that we are not attempting to usurp your responsibilities. The police are, of course, a critical link in the chain of justice. They must never do anything to jeopardize the integrity of that chain. By the same token, I have spoken of the need to expand collaboration with all our partners in the criminal justice system judiciary included, to ensure the system works fairly and efficiently for all. I hope the hallmark of my administration will be that all of you who are part of that criminal justice system see us as a partner, see us as an essential link to work with you to achieve your goals and responsibilities. We are truly, effectively, all of us in this together. I believe there is also much more we can do together, and I look forward to that partnership I've been discussing in advancing that work. Peel's ninth and last principle also stands the test of time. It says, test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder, not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it. And that, I think, goes to the heart and soul of the stop, question, and frisk issue. At a time of incredibly dramatic declines in crime in the city, in large part due to the work of the NYPD, Many in our city did not feel it in that they were constantly having encounters of, with the police in a negative way. So a patient who arguably was getting better, all the tests showed it, the patient didn't feel better because he was constantly being prodded and more medicine being applied to the illness, even after the illness had subsided significantly. So when you think of uh, Peel's comment, the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime or disorder not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it. I want my police to be there, but I want to have a city that's so safe that what they're doing there is not necessarily always seen as intrusive or abusive or invasive on the citizens that they're working to protect. By any measure, the New York City Police Department is one of the most efficient and effective police agencies in the world. To quote uh, uh, Richard Aborn, second to none. But we can always strive to do better, and we will. We're going to work very hard. We're going to work collaboratively. And if I were a betting man, as I was back in 1994, I'd bet on us. I'd bet on us, meaning not just the New York City Police Department, but you, many of you in the criminal justice system, 
and the collaboration that we will form together, then we can bet on the citizens of New York who will want to work with us, who will desire to work with us. And most importantly, as we go forward, the ultimate measure of success will be that the police officers in this city are truly seen as friends of their communities, of the communities they serve. At my announcement with uh, uh, the mayor, Mayor de Blasio, that uh, I held up a book and I thought I'd share it with this audience that could truly appreciate it from the law enforcement community. And it's the book that basically shaped my life way back, The Our Police. And the last paragraph of that book, which I read at the square in, I thought would be an appropriate way to end my brief uh, conversation with you this morning. Because it is all about what I'm about and what I want the NYPD to be, be about and how I want the public to feel about the NYPD. And it's the closing line of the book. Let me share that with you, please. You must always remember that wherever, whenever you see a policeman, he is your friend. He is there to protect you. He has dedicated his life to the preservation of the laws, the property, and the civil rights of the people in the community he serves. He would not hesitate to save your life at the cost of his own. That's the New York City Police Department. I want every citizen in this city to believe they have. I want them to feel that way about every New York City police officer. That's our goal. It's a worthwhile goal, and I believe it's one that working with you, we will achieve. So thank you for allowing me to share that vision with you this morning.